You've been uh, an integral part of American music for more than two decades. How do you view the changes in American rock and roll over that time period? Well, there have been, uh, there have been several different areas of change in, uh, in rock and roll. Uh, first of all, it started out, uh, it started out in, in, when I first was a kid and listening to it in, in the mid 50s. Uh, it was uh, more, I guess, more rural. No, not really so. I'm just thinking of the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly, but no, I guess it's, al it's always been that way. Well, the first thought that came to my mind was that the the records used to be, uh, the length of a record was about two minutes or two minutes and 20 seconds. So when people uh, wrote songs, they wrote a two-minute song. It was seldom an instrumental in a record. The songs were short and they were uh, to the point and they had a, a little hook and they were usually about uh, teenage subjects. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that is most noticeable about records since then is that is the length of the average single, I'll bet, is has gone up year after year. And uh, I'd say the, the length of the average single is probably now somewhere near four minutes, maybe d double, but double that length. So that's, that's, one, that's one thing that you find. Uh, I don't know if that's particularly about rock and roll or whether it's about technology. Uh, it's probably a, a, a bit about both because uh, as the technology improved, the instrumentation improved, uh, players got better, and solos, musical solos came into the music, and uh, uh, sounds could be changed, synthesized sounds now. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's one area that, that I think it, it changed. Uh, of course, it went through a radical change in its uh, in its lyrical thinking from the 50s to the 60s, uh, where, I mean, that was the first major change that I noticed that, uh, and that I felt that the subject matter of the songs became closer to the reality of everyday life. It wasn't just about romance and uh, will mom and dad let us do this. It was about being uh, more in, being in charge of your own life and writing about the world as you saw it. Uh, then in the 70s, uh, gradually that <laughs> music of uh, social relevance or realistic music or whatever, however, whatever term we'd like to call it, uh, speaking generally now, gave way to uh, disco music which was about uh, steady rhythm and dance and the subject matter uh, again became ir irrelevant uh, and uh, and the beat the groove became became important uh, then the reaction to that in the 80s was uh, punk and new wave movement uh, which for a while incorporated one of the elements of the earliest form of rock and roll, which was to make things very short, very high energy, and very and, and simplistic, except uh, the first time around it was done uh, with a innocence and a naivete, and the second time around with the uh, punk movement it was done intentionally to make a point. I think perhaps that's why it didn't actually have the impact as that, it w that the first time had, because the first time was was uh, a genuine expression and it was a joy joyful expression and the second time that uh, the short form came in it was uh, an, it was a strong anti statement um, then i guess uh, after that after the early early 80s punk now we're in a period of uh, yeah, I don't even know how to describe what, what we're in now. It's a sort of eclecticism again, where a lot of different uh, a lot of different styles 
seem to be uh, popular. Personally speaking, I, I don't find mo most of them very interesting. Uh, I think uh, on the same subject, am I rambling on too much? I think on the same subject, one of the things that happened, going back to the question about what was the changes in rock and roll, as the, uh, as the industry grew, the record business, when, I mean, when it started out, it was just a bunch of little companies. And the major companies weren't interested in rock and roll. Uh, and, but as the industry grew and the major companies became involved in it, uh, and corporations began to play a larger part in the creative process, or influencing the creative process. Uh, every time you feel that in, in any significant way, I, feel, I think the music gets diluted. So there was a very pure period in the 50s when nobody was paying attention because it was only small record companies. Uh, then you get into the late 50s and uh, the majors start to come in for, the, for uh, majors start record companies start to come in for the first time and uh, American Bandstand is the key uh, influence for popularity and the music starts to get less less uh, less genuine less less real uh, that's not to say that I don't look back with affection at some of the artists from that period but uh, in truth the, the the first group of people uh, uh, Elvis Presley and uh, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, uh, the Everly Brothers, uh, Ray Charles, James Brown, uh, that group of people produced a far more significant body of work than the next group, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, Faith. Well, I, I think that uh, this has to do with the fact that when the, when the companies get bigger and the corporations get bigger, the music gets blander and less interesting. The next very interesting wave that happened came from, uh, came from England with uh, uh, the English groups, uh, and obviously led by the Beatles. And that, again, was music that came from small towns, was, uh, uh, I mean, the Beatles had to travel to London to get a record contract. They were, they, they were from Liverpool. And that scene happened uh, naturally and purely and the music was uh, original and had a tremendous force. Uh, likewise, the folk movement here also was not something that people entered because they thought they were going to make a fortune out of it. Uh, and uh, that, mov that movement was very, uh, proved to be a rich source of uh, talent. Uh, as the, as, as the popularity of all of this grew and the record sales grew uh, and the industry again enters into it, that music becomes diluted again with imitators and uh, the selling process becomes more important than the creating process. So, uh, and I think this is a pattern that we, that, that, that we see and, and we see repeated again and again. Uh, to go back and and bring in the punk movement again, which uh, is interesting mostly to me uh, because it was a very strong anti-commercial statement. Uh, it wasn't interesting as, an, as a musical statement, particularly to me, but as an anti-statement, I, I thought they were they were right to be against what they were against. Uh, they were against. Uh, they were against big corporate thinking and big and marketing, and uh, that marketing process is never one that is really good for musicians. Musicians should really be able to think about music, and when they start to think about marketing, the music becomes uh, less rich. And I think the period that we're in now is a period of intense marketing. I think that the greatest innovations that have occurred in the last five or ten years have been in the area of selling, uh, of which I'd say MTV is one of the main <laughs> selling 
selling devices. And so you have a, a generation of artists that uh, are influenced by selling. Uh, I don't know whether they'll show me saying this, you know, uh, uh, nor do I necessarily think that uh, there was anything else that could, could have occurred. These cycles seem to, they, they, they seem to be just that, they seem to be cycles. Uh, that's that's where I think we're at now. Uh, we're at a, at a place where uh, the industry is now a multi-billion-dollar industry, and uh, when when corporations make decisions about who to sign, they think about how they will be able to recoup their money or make the most amount of money, and those decisions lead you to the safest possible choices and lead you away from uh, from innovation. Uh, that in turn is, uh, that information is digested by young musicians coming up and they try to give the music that they can sell. And uh, that's, uh, that's why most of the music that we have today is uh, fairly uninteresting in my opinion. That's, uh Partially the reason that we're doing this show, actually, is to try to uh, show the kids something different than they are normally seeing on MTV and just, you know, let them hear from people who, you know, mm -hmm. were and are more important than, I think, generally what they are seeing and stuff, because all they see is the same thing. Um, how have you changed as a songwriter during that same period? Well, I began writing songs when I was 13 years old. And uh, they, were, uh, they, were, they were an imitation of the songs that I, that I was hearing and listening to and liking. They were uh, uh, one, six minor, four or five chord structure that was typical of uh, rhythm and blues, doo-wop. Uh, and that was the first way I started to write. And then when I learned to play the guitar, which is, well, just about that period, and I heard uh, uh, Elvis Presley and the Everly Brothers, that was the first time I ever heard anything that really was like country or country influence. And then I began to to fool around that way and write songs in that style. You begin by imitating uh, and you learn by the process of imitation. So by the time I was 15, uh, Art Garfunkel and I had made our first record. I mean, some people, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a, unknown fact now that we, that we made a record when we were 15. It was called Hey School Girl by Tom and Jerry. And it was um, really it was an imitation of the Everly Brothers. Uh, and then I, uh, we, we, I was still in school and I, I, I was still writing and making demos uh, for songwriters. I mean, there used to be an industry where there were songwriters and in order for them to sell their songs, they would write their songs, hire uh, an artist, not an artist, they'd hire somebody to sing these songs on a demonstration record, which was called a demo. And then they would sell, send these demos around to various recording artists. This is the days before the singer-songwriter. So I was one of the people that made demos I think I used to be paid uh, twenty-five dollars for a demo, which I thought was very fair, <laughs> and uh, I learned that way too uh, by seeing what other people wrote. I learned recording techniques because I was in the studio a lot, uh, and and I tried to write in in, in that style.
at the same time, I was uh, still continuing uh, in school. I graduated from high school. I went into college. I, I didn't. I wasn't a music major. I was a English literature major. So I was reading poet poetry and. Again, I was imitating what I was reading, and uh, a lot of my songs from that period are really like, uh, you know, poetry 101 classes, you know, where I, I'm just trying to imitate whoever I was, re whoever I was reading. But these, th this is the way that one begins to learn technique. Uh, I never did really study uh, the music of the uh, songwriters that were pre-rock and roll seriously until much later in my life. So I just, my, my, my uh, practical background was just rock and roll, record making and rock and roll. Um, I wrote The Sound of Silence when I was 21 years old and I recorded it when I was 23, and it was a hit when I was 20, became a hit about a year and a half later. Uh, I was influenced by my early rock and roll uh, roots, if, those, if that's the word, street corner singing. Those sounds were always in my Year. I mean, I, ha I have a very strong oral memory of, of a certain time of music. And that, that, that time and that sound is something that has an emotional, uh, it strikes an emotional chord in me. And I, I try and find that emotional chord even today. I still look for the, that sound in some form. I mean, I don't know that, that the listener would recognize it, but I look for it. It has some emotional validity. Uh, so I took that. I was influenced by uh, the folk movement. I mean, uh, in the early 60s, uh, Bleecker's, Bleecker and McDougal Street were the focal points of uh, folk music in, uh, in New York. And I used to come into Manhattan and come and hang around in the clubs. And uh, people were listening to the Weavers and people were listening to Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan was just beginning then, Phil Oaks was beginning around then. I remember seeing those guys in coffee houses, you know, on Hootenanny nights. They'd get up and sing. And I, I liked that. I liked the freedom that they had to, to speak on a lot of subjects, and I began to try to write that way too, still incorporating this my rock and roll background. Um, and then I moved to England, and I lived in England for a few years in the, in the mid '60s, around the time that the Beatles were just beginning. I mean, just coincidentally, I happened to move there at the time that the Beatles were were starting up. Uh, but I was playing in folk clubs, and. Uh, I learned a lot about performing and writing from different English folk musicians. Uh, Martin Carthy was one. Ian Campbell, the Ian Campbell folk group. That was a big group then. I'm, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think that a couple of Ian Campbell's kids are in uh, UB40. Now, so I mean, it's the next generation uh, passing on. Um, the people that I was reading, the uh, the poets that I read, or the literature that I read, had an effect upon what I was thinking. And again, that 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 came into uh, my music. And I guess in those days. I mean, shortly thereafter was the, was the success of Simon and Garfunkel, which uh, that, that started, and I think that was ni early 1966, was The Sound of Silence was a hit. And that was a, really a straight span of hits uh, 
until we stopped in 1970 with Bridge Over Troubled Water. So during that period of time, uh, my songwriting developed. I began to study music. My father was a musician, but I didn't really learn too much about music from my father. So I began to study uh, guitar with teachers and harmony and to start to pick up my craft in a more traditional way. Uh, when Simon and Garfunkel stopped being a, a team, I began to explore other music that I was interested in, uh, music that was not American, uh, music from South America, uh, El Condor Paso was from, came from that exploration, and reggae music, ska, which preceded reggae, was something I was interested in, and then reggae, and then I went to record uh, Mother and Child Reunion in Jamaica, and that was in 19, 1971 or two. And I began to feel that, the, that there was a lot of music from all over the world that was interesting. And I thought that popular music really expanded worldwide and didn't necessarily stop at the borders of the U.S. and, uh, and England. And that influenced me as well. And as you keep writing, just the practice of it, you begin to learn uh, how to alter the shape of a song. Uh, and the idea is, I think, to get your technique down to the point where you don't have to think about technique at all and that you can just work with your imagination. And you don't have to think now, how many, how should this go? How, should, how many bars should be here? Or you, 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 know, you know your technique so, so well, you study your technique so well that you can make any leap of the imagination that, that you want, and you know that the technique will be there to, to support it. That's, uh, I think, uh, something that applies to all forms of writing and not just songwriting. I mean, it applies to other musical forms, and it applies to poetry and, and prose writing as well. And now, uh, I think in the last few years I feel more comfortable than ever with, with the, all of these different aspects of my background and interest and in combining them in any way that, in any way that I feel is uh, musical or interesting. And I think of it all as rock and roll or pop, or whatever name you want to call it. I don't think the name is really is important. So that, that total picture is how, one, uh, is how one learns to write. The more, the more you develop your interests in life, and the more you study the technique of your music uh, the more <clears throat> easily you'll be able to express whatever your emotions and your mind bring out. I remember about, about um, between the last Simon and Garfunkel album and your first solo album around that time, 71, um, I remember how chord structure changed, I think, in your writing. I think once you began to make those solo albums, the first couple especially come to mind, I remember the chords being a lot more complicated and a lot more melodic and pretty and, and the craft was just, you know, it was, to me it was so different than, you know, say the Simon and Garfunkel songs which I guess were based on the earlier influences. Yes, the Simon and Garfunkel period uh, the music from, that I wrote in that period is really drawn from two, two sources, and that is uh, 
uh, early rock and roll, the rock and roll of the 50s that we grew up with, and uh, folk music, the folk music of England and the U.S. More England than the U.S. because that's really where I learned it. But when I left Simon and Garfunkel and began to write solo material, I also began to study harmony and theory with, uh, with a teacher. And I began to explore writing uh, in a way that was, that differed from traditional rock and roll chords. And so it became more melodic music it became more melodic and on a certain level it became less rhythmic because when you have more complex chord structures, you're changing chords more often and you can't just find a groove and stay with it. Uh, and when, when, you find, uh, when, you, when you can find a groove and stay with it, well, I, I, I should go back. That's really not so. You can be melodic even with a simple, even with a simple chord structure. But you will be melodic in a certain way, which is uh, you will be melodic in a diatonic sense, meaning that you will pretty much stay within the notes of a major scale. When you start to change the chord structure in such a way that you're modulating and changing keys, uh, you're, you're able to be melodic in a uh, chromatic sense, and, and you're using all the notes in the scale, uh, in a chromatic scale, as opposed to the eight notes of, of a regular scale. And I, for a certain period of time there, when I was learning this, used to, as, a, as an exercise, make it a point to get every note, all 12 notes of the chromatic scale into a song, just as an exercise to, to, to make sure that I was finding every way I could go. And uh, that idea occurred to me because I was listening to and studying the music of uh, Juan Carlos Jobim, and he did that a lot in his music, he, using all the notes. And I began to try and do that myself, just to be able to write different kinds of melodies. Uh, after I absorbed that for a while and, and began to write that way, well, then I became interested in rhythm again, and I, and I moved back into... I moved back into uh, rhythm playing. Um, another thing that uh, an another another thing that influences the the way you write and the melody is uh, the instrument that you work to compose work with to compose. And I'm a guitarist. Uh, the guitarists tend to be more rhythm players, I think, than the piano people. That's a generalization because there's a lot of piano guys who really are, you know, can play really great rhythm. I mean, Billy, Billy Joel is a melodic and rhythmic piano player. He, can, he really can do anything. Uh, but the guitarists, because the first thing you learn is just to, just to you know, sit there on an E chord and play, uh, that tends to be more, more rhythmic. Uh, I studied some classical guitar, so I started to play you know, this kind of finger style more than this. And that, then I, with that, I started to write in a more pianistic style on the guitar. And that is how uh, songs like uh, Something So Right or American Tune, even Bridge Over Troubled Water, which is really the beginning of, of that change of chord structure style. That's how those songs uh, Emerge still crazy after all these years is, is is it would be an example of of that. Even fifty ways to leave your lover, which uh, you know has a kind of a melodic section and then goes into a rhythm section, uses uh, that idea. Um, let's see. Uh, your songs uh, paint interesting and detailed reflections of uh, the changes America goes through. Um, do you consciously draw on that? I, I don't write consciously about a subject. 
I really write. I really write entirely from the subconscious. I, I, I don't know what it is that I'm going to write about, and I tend to write about things that are personal. Uh, sometimes uh, a political theme will emerge, but I'm not a political writer, and I don't specifically set out to make, uh, make moral or political points. Uh, I feel that uh, these, these feelings and these attitudes emerge naturally from, from the songs, and I don't, aim, I don't aim to get them. So I, I, I'm not a, I, I, on, this, on a lyrical sense, I am not a conscious writer uh, as the lyrics first emerge. I let whatever it, my feelings are, whatever's in my heart, I try and let that come out, and then, then I will try and shape it. Uh, I'll try and, because sometimes phrases, sometimes I make up phrases that I don't really think make any sense to anybody else but me. So when that happens, uh, if the phrase is interesting, I'll try and keep the phrase and somehow explain it in the rest of the song. But the first impulse is subconscious and not conscious. Uh, back in the mid-60s, you, uh, Bob Dylan, and a few others were being called rock poets. Did you see yourself in that light? The term, uh, well, it was very popular uh, reference, rock poets in the 60s. At the time, I didn't feel that uh, it really applied. And in fact, I still don't feel that it, that it applied to uh, it. It wasn't really poetry, but it was lyric writing that was cognizant of the use of language in a way that could be poetic. Uh, still, the main idea was to get smooth lyrics that could flow with a melody. The, but if you could do that with uh, imagery or language that was richer than had been previously uh, the norm, well, then that, that became something that, that we were interested in and something that, that, that we liked. And there was a stretch in that direction. Because it was the first time that people were stretching in that direction, the excesses of that thought process or movement became, uh, you know, the, the valleys of your mind type of lyrics. And so they became cliches and they were, they were silly. But it was an attempt to make the language of song closer to the language of poetry. And I felt and still do feel that, that that was a very valid point that there's no that there was it, it, it wasn't necessary that that lyrics be entirely cliche or entirely vernacular that there was there was a place for language to be used and that since rock and roll was the the medium that we all communicated with or in there was no reason why it had to stay at the, at, the, uh, at the lowest literary level. Uh, again, that's not to say that I wanted all of the music to, to rise up and suddenly become like a combination of Chuck Berry and uh, Wallace Stevens. I, that's not what I meant. There was a place, obviously, for, for you know, good old bar rock and roll, but there was also a place to express more complex ideas and, and to have a richer sense of language in the music. And I, I felt that then, although I didn't, I didn't really think I had the abilities to do it then, and I feel it now. I think it's very important. Otherwise, the music will stay uh, at a very, it will stay at a, at a, at a very simple level and will appeal only to, to, to the youngest groups, 
because it will be fresh to them because they haven't heard it before. But other people, all of us, that we all, who all grew up on rock and roll, will be bored by these simple thoughts and will leave the music. And the music is a very nourishing form of music. It always was. So I do think it's something that I would like to see more people aspire to, 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 to have the language of rock and roll be richer. Um, what's that smile about? <laughs> Just thinking how, how serious I sound about all of this stuff. <laughs> it's all true, but I like I know that I always seem much more serious than I am because I'm laughing most of the time. <laughs> but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> or the affliction, whatever. One of the two. Um, what song that you wrote during the uh, folk rock era? I guess primarily during the Simon and Garfunkel days, do you feel was most representative of being your best work and why? Well, let me think. Simon and Garfunkel period. I, I always think of the, the quintessential Simon and Garfunkel song as the boxer. Uh, it was musically folk rock and it was, uh, it was a story song And it seemed to be thematically like like other pieces that I did. It just seemed. I mean, sometimes when I look back on it now, I, I I'm just surprised that that that's what I was feeling then. Because in my early work, I mean, I tend to not to think about my early work. I mean, I tend to think of it as early early work and not pay much attention to it. But in my case, my early work was uh, was very popular. I mean, uh, "Sound of Silence," as I as I said earlier, I, was a song that I wrote when I was twenty one years old. <clears throat> so to have a, a piece of work that you did when you were twenty one be like one of the most popular things that you've done is un you know uh, it's odd in a certain sense to to, to realize that your early work is is a, maybe the most popular of your work. Of the Simon and Garfunkel period songs, I think the most representative and probably the best, therefore, were uh, uh, Sound of Silence, uh, Mrs. Robinson, uh, America, The Boxer, Bridge Over Troubled Water, or Waters, whichever one it is. Those were, I think, the most, uh, I think those were the most typical and influential. After writing the song America in the 60s, uh, in the 70s you wrote American Tune. Um, did you feel that they were similar? How did they differ? And uh, if you can recall, what was the inspiration for American Tune? Um, American Tune I always called my McGovern Sore Loser song. It was, it was written around the time when Nixon was elected and I was depressed. I was a supporter of George McGovern in that presidential campaign. And I think it was really the end of the liberal movement. It was the not the end of the movement, but it was the end of the <clears throat> it was the end of the liberal movement as a major force in American thinking. Uh, 
the Kennedys, brothers had been assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, the uh, cream of the liberal thinkers and the most charismatic figures were gone, and the country moved uh, towards the right. And American Tune really was about that subject. It, was, it really was about the feeling of uh, weariness at what had come to, to pass and uh, a disappointment. And I, that's, that's what I felt at the time when I wrote it. What are some uh, current <coughs> American uh, artists or rock and roll bands today that you, you know that you admire? Well, what what bands do I admire today? Uh, I, I'm not pausing because there's no one. Uh, it's hard. It's it's a. <clears throat> these questions are hard questions to to answer. You know, I mean, there really are there really are quite a, quite a lot right. that that are good. You know, I mean, and to pick start to pick it out and say this and that. I'm okay. We'll go on to another one, um, which is almost the same. <laughs> Associate, if you can, the uh, following artists um, with their relevance in the history of American music. And perhaps give us your personal views on them. Uh, Woody Guthrie. Well, Woody Guthrie was a, a populist songwriter. He was a, <clears throat> a natural. Uh, he wrote melodic songs about uh, topical subjects, and uh, and he wrote really one of the great American anthems: "This land is your land." I'll, do, I'll say it again. <coughs> or maybe I need a glass of water. Perhaps give us your personal views on Woody Guthrie. Uh, Woody Guthrie was—he uh, was a, a great natural songwriter. Uh, he, he wrote very melodic songs that everyone could sing, and the and the language in them was uh, was rich and often poetic. And he wrote uh, one of the great American anthems, "This Land Is Your Land," and was really, uh, the father of the folk movement. And as we know, he was a great influence on Bob Dylan, who was a great influence on many, many other people. So he was a very significant American songwriter, not of the Tin Pan Alley School, although that was the time frame uh, during which he, he lived and wrote. He was radical. He was a left... Uh, you know his thinking. His thinking was pro was probably considered radical then. Certainly would be considered radical now. In that he was a, a you know very pro union and 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 left thinking politically. Uh, but I think he was just a nat just a naturally gifted songwriter. And those people come along uh, rarely. You know. I mean, I think I think you had another one in Irving Berlin. I mean, even more gifted. Just natural, naturally great uh, people. Are just they're able to make up songs, simple songs. I think he wrote thousands of songs, Woody, from what I understand. How about Bob Dylan? Uh, Bob Dylan was really the first writer of the rock and roll, post rock and roll uh, time of music who elevated 
uh, lyric writing to the point where it became significant and people listened to the lyrics to hear something about the way we lived and the way life was at the time. And that was a tremendous innovation. Uh, he also was one of the, uh, probably the main catalyst, infusing uh, two forms of music, just as Elvis Presley was able to combine country music and blues, uh, Bob Dylan did the same for uh, folk music and, uh, and rock and roll. So there's no question that his place as a, as a songwriter and uh, musical thinker is uh, is secure, major figure. How about Bruce Springsteen? Well, Bruce Springsteen is also a. Well. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes very hard to uh, distinguish between a sociological phenomenon and, uh, and the work. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Bruce is really, I think, more sociological phenomenon than, than songwriter. But I really have to be quick to qualify that because I don't mean that he's not a, not a really good songwriter because he is a really good songwriter. But his popularity is so immense and he, he has come to be a, a symbol for uh, some, something vastly American that I tend to think of him more in those terms than I do as purely a songwriter. I mean, as a songwriter, I think he's influenced by, uh, his influences are uh, uh, Dylan, Van Morrison, and rock and, you know, Jersey rock and roll, you know, bar, bar band rock and roll. And uh, his subject matter, sort of working class America, is uh, well, even the subject matter, you know, he's not the first person to write in that subject matter. <clears throat> uh, he does it well, and he sings with a passion. But as I say, I really can't, I really can't di divorce him from, from the phenomenal response to the person of Bruce. Because, I mean, he's, he, he appears to be, and from everything that I know of him personally, which is not, n not a great deal, but I, I mean, I, I, met him, I met him once or, once or twice, three times, something like that. And he seems to be a person with uh, great uh, personal integrity. And that comes through in his music, and it comes through in his stance. And, uh, and all of these things combine to make for the phenomenon of Bruce Springsteen and make it difficult to assess where he stands as a songwriter at this point in time. You'll have to, history will have to uh, give us some more information. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, do you feel music has the power to change things? Well, <clears throat> I think things change. And, uh, it's easy to see a cause and effect relationship between music and change. But if there were no music, things would still change. Uh, I will say this, music, it, it doesn't destroy anything. It's, it's, uh, it's positive, uh, it's, uh, it's joyous, and it's a force uh, for pleasure and for 
communication uh, and throughout the world. And people are so in need of, of, uh, of touching other people that it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's just an absolutely vital human element. And it's lyrical thinking from the 50s to the 60s, uh, where, I mean, that was the first major change that I noticed that, uh, and that I felt that the subject matter of the songs became closer to the reality of everyday life. It wasn't just about romance and uh, will mom and dad let us do this? It was about being, uh, more in, being in charge of your own life and writing about the world as you saw it. Uh, then in the 70s, uh, gradually that <laughs> music of uh, social relevance or realistic music or whatever, however, whatever term we'd like to call it, uh, speaking generally now, gave way to uh, disco music, which was about uh, steady rhythm and dance. And the subject matter, uh, again, became ir irrelevant. Uh, and, uh, and the beat, the groove became, became important. Uh, then the reaction to that in the 80s was uh, punk and new wave movement. Uh, which for a while incorporated one of the elements of the earliest form of rock and roll, which was to make things very short, very high energy, and very and, and simplistic, except uh, the first time around it was done uh, with a innocence and a naivete, and the second time around with the uh, punk movement it was done intentionally to make a point. I think perhaps that's why it didn't actually have the impact as that, it w that the first time had, because the first time was was uh, a genuine expression and it was a joy, joyful expression. And the second time that uh, the short form came in, it was, uh, an, it was a strong anti-statement. Um, then I guess uh, after that, after the early, early 80s punk, now we're in a period of uh, yeah, well, I don't even know how to describe what, what were Little Hook, and they were usually about uh, teenage subjects. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that is most noticeable about records since then is that is the length of the average single, I'll bet, has, has gone up year after year. And I'd say the, the length of the average single is probably now somewhere near four minutes, maybe double, double that length. So that's that's one that's one thing that you find. Uh, I don't know if that's particularly about rock and roll or whether it's about technology. Uh, it's probably a, a, a bit about both because uh, as the technology improved, the instrumentation improved, uh, players got better, and solos, musical solos, came into the music, and uh, uh, sounds could be changed, synthesized sounds now. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's one area that, that I think it, it changed. Uh, of course, it went through a radical change in its... Uh... You've been uh, an integral part of American music for more than two decades. How do you view the changes in American rock and roll over that time period? Well, there have been uh, there have been several different areas of change in uh, in rock and roll. Uh, first of all, it started out uh, it started out in, in when I first was a kid and listening to it in, in the mid fifties. Uh, it was uh, more, I guess, more rural. No, not really so. I'm just thinking of the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly, but no, I guess it's, al it's always been that way. Well, the first thought that came to my mind was that the, the records used to be, uh, the length of a record was about two minutes or two minutes and 20 seconds. So when people uh, wrote songs, 
they wrote a two-minute song. It was seldom an instrumental in a record. The songs were short and they were uh, to the point and they had it in now. It's a sort of eclecticism again where a lot of different uh, a lot of different styles seem to be uh, popular. Personally speaking, I, I don't find mo most of them very interesting. Uh, I think uh, on the same subject, am I rambling on too much? I think on the same subject, one of the things that happened, going back to the question about what was the changes in rock and roll, as the uh, as the industry grew, the record business, when, I mean, when it started out, it was just a bunch of little companies. And the major companies weren't interested in rock and roll. Uh, and, but as the industry grew and the major companies became involved in it, uh, and corporations began to play a larger part in the creative process or influencing the creative process, uh, every time you feel that in, in any significant way, I, feel, I think the music 